Welcome to the deep dive. So today we are uh, strapping in for a look at something pretty wild. Three Iapolis. Ah, yes. The interstellar visitor. Exactly. This like 33 billion ton object that just kind of screamed through our solar system or a real relic from the galaxy's depths, as some called it. It definitely stirred things up, big headlines, serious security talks, and well, some really amazing science. It certainly did. And, you know, the physics alone demanded that kind of attention. What really set 3ILS apart was its trajectory. It was just extreme. Extreme how? We're talking a highly hyperbolic orbit. Its eccentricity was about 6.1, which yeah. basically means it wasn't just passing through. It was uh, almost flying in a straight line relative to the sun's influence. That's fast, right? Incredibly fast, about 58 kilometers per second relative to the sun. That's its speed way out uh, beyond gravitational pulls. 58 kilometers per second. Okay, let me just, that's roughly what, 130,000 miles an hour? Pretty much, yeah. Wow, that's like way faster than anything we've ever launched. Three times faster, maybe. Something like that. And that speed, plus the sheer mass of this thing, well, that created this uh, this tension, you could say. Tension between? Between the intense scientific curiosity, wanting to study this unique visitor, and, well, the understandable security concerns. Planetary defense had to take a look. Right. Makes sense. So that's our job today, then, <laughs> to kind of unpack all that. Exactly. We're going to dig into the data you shared Look really closely at that flight path that got people talking, you know, the sharp turns. Ah, yes, the sharp turns. We definitely need to cover those. We will. And we'll cover the security side of things. And then maybe the coolest part, what this tells us about chemistry out there beyond our solar system. Okay, sounds like a plan. But first, let's get our bearings. Can we quickly run through the key dates and distances? The when and where is always helpful. Good idea. Right, so distances in space, we usually use AU, astronomical units. 1 AU is the Earth-Sun distance. Got it. Okay. So 3 IS, it was spotted on July 1st, 2025. This was pretty far out then, about 4.5 AU. Still way out past Mars. Way out. Then its closest pass to Mars happened on October 3rd. That was much closer, just 0.19 AU. 0 0.19, so about 28 million kilometers. That's right. Roughly a fifth of the distance from Earth to the Sun. Pretty close shave with Mars, relatively speaking. Okay, what else? It hit perihelion. It's closest point to our sun on October 30th at 1.36 AU. So still outside Earth's orbit then. Correct. And importantly for, you know, peace of mind, its closest approach to Earth was much further out. December 19th at a comfortable 1.8 AU. 1.8 AU, that's like 270 million kilometers. So definitely not close call for Earth. Not at all. Very safe distance. Which brings us neatly to the big controversy or maybe just the big confusion those visuals, the 3D models, you know, like NASA eyes, they show these really dramatic bends, almost like sharp turns in its path. Yeah, those visualizations caused quite a stir. We saw similar to base around Oumuamua, didn't we? People immediately started thinking, is it steering itself? Is there some kind of propulsion? What was really going on with those turns? Well, this is where perception gets tricky, especially when you try to flatten a 3D path onto a 2D screen or map. The reality is, this object's path was governed almost entirely by gravity. Clear Keplerian dynamics. So the turns weren't real maneuvers. Not in the sense of sudden acceleration or steering, no. They were more like optical illusions, mm -hmm. artifacts of the projection combined with the natural, continuous pull of gravity from planets. Because it's moving so fast on that hyperbolic trajectory, even small gravitational nudges look exaggerated in those visualizations. Okay, break it down for us. There were two main points people flagged, okay. right? What caused that first apparent turn when it was still coming in? Right, the first one. That happened when it was still way out, around 5 AU or so, mm. and it lines up perfectly with a very slight gravitational nudge from Jupiter. Jupiter, even way out there. Oh yeah, Jupiter's gravity is immense. Right. It's the heavyweight champ of the solar system. Even at 5 AU, it tweaked the object's path by uh, maybe half a degree to one degree, yeah. very small. And the change in speed from that. Tiny. The total delta V, the change in velocity, was only about 0.2 to 0.5 meters per second. Basically negligible for something this massive. Okay, barely a tap. So what about the second turn? The one that looked much sharper right before it passed Mars? That one was the classic gravitational slingshot effect. As it zipped past Mars at that close distance, 0.19 AU, Mars gravity bent its trajectory. How much? By maybe two or three degrees. Again, it looks sharp on the map because the object is moving so fast still, around 55 kilometers per second during that flyby, and the visualization compresses the vast distances involved. So it's like watching a race car from far away. A slight curve looks like a sharp turn. 
Exactly. If you zoomed out and looked at its path on a galactic scale, it would just look like a near-perfect straight line with a slight curve around the sun. But hang on, how can we be absolutely sure? Couldn't there have been, say, a brief engine burn or some massive outgassing event that just happened to occur near Mars? That's where the observation data is just crucial. And thankfully, it was incredibly precise. We gathered over 500 astrometric measurements. Astrometric, that's like pinpointing its position against background stars, right? Precisely. And the accuracy was phenomenal. The position errors were less than 0.1 arc seconds. Wow, wait. 0.1 arc seconds. Remind me how small that is. Uh, think of seeing a single human hair from about a mile away. Uh -huh. It's that precise. Okay, that's really precise. It is. And our models, mm -hmm. based purely on gravity, fit that data perfectly. Mm -hmm. If there was any other force acting on it, what we call non-gravitational forces, like maybe jets of gas escaping, Kiyo Euro or something, it had to be incredibly weak. That weak. Our upper limits put any anomalous acceleration at less than 10 to the minus 5 meters per second squared. For an object weighing 33 billion tons, that's, yeah. well, it's essentially zero. Any natural outgassing was insignificant, and any artificial force strong enough to cause those turns would have needed to be huge, and we'd have detected it. Okay, that makes sense. And that inertia, 33 billion tons, doesn't just change direction easily. Not without leaving a trace. Which leads us right into the security side. Okay, so gravity explains the path, that's reassuring. But the sheer potential of this thing, if the path had been different, that kinetic energy is still mind-boggling. How did the planetary defense folks handle that what if? They absolutely had to take it seriously. You can't ignore the basic physics. At 58 kilometers per second, if it were on an impact trajectory, the energy release would be catastrophic. Around 10 to the 21 joules. 10 to the 21. How, how does that compare to, say, the dinosaur impact? Uh, much, much bigger. We're talking the equivalent of about 100,000 megatons of TNT. It dwarfs Chicxulub. So, yes, the potential threat absolutely justified the intense 247 monitoring by systems like NASA's Sentry. So the theory was high risk, but the practical risk was zero because we knew the path so precisely. That's exactly it. NASA's Sentry system, which is constantly running the numbers, always rated the impact probability as zero. It was a Turin scale zero event. And that confidence came from? From those hundreds of observations. They allowed us to nail down its position uncertainty to less than a kilometer by the time it reached perihelion. The data just overwhelmingly ruled out any possibility of it being deliberately redirected or you know, accidentally nudged towards Earth. What specific evidence beyond just the trajectory fitting gravity helps rule out anything artificial? Like, did we look for engine signatures or anything? Oh, absolutely. Spectral analysis was key. Big telescopes like the VLT, Hubble, and especially the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, they looked very closely at the light coming from it. Where? And they found signatures consistent with a natural comet. We saw carbon dioxide, water, specifically a CO to water ratio around 1.4%, yeah. plus hints of things like cyanide, CN, and even nickel ice, completely natural stuff. No signs of, you know, exotic isotopes or weird heat signatures you might expect from artificial propulsion. Okay. And what about the energy needed if someone wanted to steer this thing towards Earth? Well, that's where it gets kind of absurd from an engineering standpoint. Yeah. To change its velocity enough to target Earth, we're talking a delta V of maybe 10 to 15 kilometers per second for an object that massive. Yeah. You'd need an onboard energy release approaching yeah. 10 to the 20 joules. 10 to the 20 joules. Okay. Put that in context again. What would that look like from Earth if something released that much energy near the object? Would SETI see it? Would it look like a supernova? It would be. Yeah. Spectacular and, and instantly noticeable. Depending on how, how the energy was released, maybe a huge flare, possibly even a gamma ray burst signature, or at the very least, a massive, unmistakable thermal or spectral event. SETI scans, military surveillance, astronomical survey, it's something that would have picked it up loud and clear across vast distances. It wouldn't be subtle. So the lack of any such detection is pretty strong evidence against it. Extremely strong. Our analysis, running countless simulations Monte Carlo models, put the odds of any kind of intentional redirection targeting Earth at less than one in a billion, mm -hmm. probably closer to less than one in a trillion. It's just vanishingly improbable. Okay. Risk. Zero. Science. Fascinating. Which brings us to the effort involved in getting that science. This wasn't just a couple of quick looks, was it? It sounds like a major campaign. Oh, it was a symphony, really. A global effort. You had Hubble tracking its precise motion, that high-speed hyperbolic path. Right. You had ground-based giants like the VLT using instruments like X-Shooter to hunt for specific molecules. Trying to get that composition nailed down. Exactly. Gemini North was involved. 
and there was even a bit of luck. The test satellite, which normally hunts for exoplanets, actually spotted it before the official discovery back in May 2025. Just happened to be looking in the right direction. Wow, a pre-discovery detection. Mm -hmm. But the real game changer for understanding what it was made of was JWST. Right, absolutely. JWST's infrared capabilities, particularly the NRSpec instrument, were perfect for this. It gave us high-resolution spectroscopy, letting us pick out those specific molecular fingerprints. Like the car euro and water you mentioned. Right. Co-euro at 4.3 microns, water at 2.7 microns. That data let us figure out it was basically a dusty comet with about 10 times more gas than dust coming off it. And crucially, JWST also helped detect OCS carbonyl sulfide. Carbonyl sulfide. Okay, we'll come back to why that's interesting. But first, there was a tricky period for observations, wasn't there? The solar conjunction. Ah, yes. The blackout period. For several weeks in October and November, from Earth's perspective, 3 Iox was too close to the sun in the sky. Our ground telescopes and even Hubble were basically blinded. So how did we keep tabs on it during that critical time, especially around the Mars flyby? That's where having assets elsewhere in the solar system became absolutely vital. We relied heavily on our eyes at Mars. You mean the orbiters? Exactly. Yeah. MRO, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter with its high-rise camera, and the European Mars Express Orbiter with its Nomad spectrometer. They became our forward observers. So high-rise was actually trying to take pictures of it as it flew past Mars. That was the plan. Trying to get images with a resolution of about 30 kilometers per pixel, the hope was maybe, just maybe, resolve the shape of the nucleus or see large features, perhaps down to 100 meters or so. That's incredible. Using Mars orbiters as interstellar object detectors, it really shows the value of that infrastructure. Did this whole event push observing technology forward? It definitely did. We saw the power of AI in finding these things faster. Recovery algorithms, like the one ZTF uses, can now sift through archival data and flag potential candidates in hours, not weeks. And looking ahead. Well, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory is poised to be a complete game changer. Once it's fully online, scanning the whole sky repeatedly, predictions are it could find maybe 10 to 100 of these interstellar objects every year. Wow, from maybe one every few years to potentially dozens a year? That'll change everything. It'll give us a real catalog, a proper census of these visitors. Okay, so let's talk legacy. We've got this, this chunk of stuff from another star system, potentially very old. What did it actually teach us about places beyond our solar system? It's like getting a sample delivered right to our doorstep, albeit one we couldn't physically grab. The chemistry is the key. It suggests three I-8 layers likely formed in a relatively cool environment, one that was perhaps low in carbon. Where might that be? Possibly in the outer disk around a star, smaller and cooler than our sun, like a key dwarf. And maybe not from our immediate galactic neighborhood, perhaps from the galactic thick disk, an older population of stars. And you mentioned it's old. Very old. As Sivitz put its age somewhere between 7 and 10 billion years. That means it formed before our own solar system even existed. So we're literally looking at chemistry from before the sun and planets formed here. Wow. Exactly. It's like sampling grandfather chemistry, the stuff that was around in the galaxy long before our solar system got going. And the composition is different, distinct. Remember that OCS, the carbonyl sulfide? Yeah, what's the significance of that? OCS is interesting because it points towards sulfur chemistry, which might play a role in prebiotic processes, the steps leading towards life. We look for similar sulfur compounds when we study potentially habitable moons like Europa. Seeing it in an interstellar object suggests these kinds of potentially important ingredients are widespread. So the building blocks might be common out there. Does this one object help us estimate how many things like it are wandering the galaxy? It gives us a data point, a crucial benchmark. Its passage helps refine our estimates for the local density of these isos. The current thinking is around 10 to the minus 5 objects per cubic parsec. Okay. And scaling that up across the whole Milky Way? It implies a staggering number, something like 10 to the 16, that's 10 million billion similar objects roaming the galaxy. Good grief. That's a lot of interstellar wanderers. Could they have played a role here on early Earth? Oh, potentially a major role. Models suggest these objects could have been significant delivery vehicles early on. They might have brought substantial amounts of water, maybe billions of kilograms, and complex organic molecules to the young planets, including Earth. So connecting the chemistry of the galaxy directly to the origins of life here, that's profound. It really is. Okay, let's try and summarize this for everyone listening. If you had to pick, say, the three biggest takeaways from this whole 3 I Atlas encounter, what would they be? Okay, three things. First, those sharp turns. 
They were just gravitational illusions, perfectly explained by the pull of Jupiter and Mars and confirmed by incredibly precise data. Nothing weird going on there. Right. Gravitational echoes. Exactly. Second, despite the immense kinetic energy it carried, 3i Atlas was definitely a natural comet, not artificial, and posed absolutely zero impact risk to Earth. Our tracking is that good. Okay. Natural object, zero risk. And third, the huge observation campaign was a success. It validated our planetary defense tracking, and it gave us this unprecedented snapshot of ancient chemistry from another star system, possibly dating back 7 to 10 billion years, a window into the galaxy's past. That's a great summary, an amazing scientific story. But, you know, thinking about the future, and especially that Mars flyby, there's one more little idea that kind of emerges, doesn't it? A provocative thought. Ooh, look on. Well, the object passed really close to Mars, right? 0.19 AU. And as you said, it was active, shedding dust and gas. Like comets do, yes. So if it was shedding material interstellar dust near Mars, where did that dust go? Some of it would have fallen onto Mars, entered its thin atmosphere, and settled on the surface. Exactly. So potentially, right now, sitting on the Martian surface, mixed in with the regular red dust, there could be tiny grains of interstellar dust from 3i Atlas. Huh. Interstellar dust on Mars. Think about it. If future Mars missions, maybe sample return missions associated with Artemis or later programs, were targeted to areas that were under the flyby path, they could potentially collect Martian soil containing actual samples from another star system. A hybrid sample. Interstellar material collected on another planet. A fusion of samples captured because our Martian robots were there to watch it fly by. That's definitely something for you, the listener, to maybe ponder and explore further. The hunt for interstellar dust on Mars. That is quite a prospect. A sample return mission with an interstellar bonus, definitely something worth thinking about. A truly remarkable visitor and a testament to our ability to watch the skies. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive into 3i Agulis. We'll catch you on the next one.